So uh, good afternoon, everybody out there in social media land. My name is Mike, and this is Tim. Tim. Tim, Tim. Tell, us a little, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I am a father of eight children, soon to be nine children, um, which is majority of my life. I'm a network engineer for a very big transportation company out here in Phoenix, um, and that's I love that experience that I have. I'm also a Navy veteran. I did all nearly 10 years in the Navy. Um, yeah, that's and, and I love Jesus with all my heart. So. Yeah. Okay. Real world experience, right? So I watched the the the, um, the TV show, which was lifelong, really dumb stuff, right? I watched um, what was that? Like where they had like seven people living in a motor home. It was on MTV. I oh, was like nineteen oh or twenty geez. years old. No, no, no. It's um, I know what you're talking about because they went to San Diego. And I was going. I was growing up in San Diego. That's how I found out San Diegans are brutal people. Um, San Diegans. San <laughs> <laughs> nope, not going to Anchorman. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's like real world ru yeah, yeah. road rules. There road rules. Road rules. Road rules. Okay. Yeah. 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 So tell me a little bit. What's it, what's it like having eight children? Um, everyone talks about. Um, controlled chaos when you hear people talk about controlled chaos it's a farce there's you can't control chaos because that's the definition of the word of chaos is you know scattered crazy so i don't say controlled chaos i say contained chaos so i have boundaries and chaos happens inside of it um i think uh is uh, not um gaffigan the comedian i saw something he said uh, he's Catholic. I think mm -hmm. he's devout Catholic, or or was it at when I was when I read this book, or this meme, and his joke goes, uh, he's having his fourth kid, and someone comes up to him and says, "Wow, four kids! How's that? What's that like?" And he goes, "You know what it feels like to be drowning, and then someone hands you a baby. <laughs> that's what it feels like." It's like, yes, that's it's pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty accurate. Wow. So today, um, in today's podcast, we'll be talking quite a bit about uh, absolute truth. So we started this conversation with another one of our, our wonderful people from church here, Derek. He's not here with us. He's gone to be at work, not That's with good. the Lord, okay. not with the Lord, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> he did scare me a bit because, you know, he had, I was texting him, and he normally he'd text me back right away. Well, this time it took him like, I don't know, eight or nine hours. But he works at night, so anyways. But we're going to be talking about absolute truth. And when we had left off the conversation, we had defined some parts of what absolute truth is. We actually ended up talking about what scripture or how, how it is we can even bring scripture into the conversation of absolute truth. Uh, what we know or what, we want, what we're saying is that absolute truth uh, is, well, the title says it all, right? It's absolute. There's no, it, it doesn't assent to something else in order for it to be true. Um, and having eight children... Right, I've I've got to believe that at times that co that that context comes into a bit of a question there with with kids and hey did you do this no it was so and so no I'm pretty sure it was so and so how's that work out at home usually oh man jeez that's that's the blame game is huge in my house um, I don't know the one thing that I find about absolute truth is that it defines your personality yeah. Uh, depending on what your absolute belief is, even if you believe there is no absolute truth, that is an absolute belief. Is there's a finality to it? Well, right. there's no absolute truth. Well, that's the absolute truth for you that there isn't one. Um, and so, having eight children to try and teach them how what absolute is. Uh, I mean, first off, it's so far-fetched out there for some of these young kids but it's uh, it's like oh it's okay you know what is what is right and what is wrong mm. is what it boils down to um and we see it even in the message that the lord gives us through the bible right, right? he taught he starts us off with i love you i created you okay you guys did bad i, f I f i'm upset about it i'm going to mm. start over with noah right we don't we don't have any right and wrong until we get to moses so we've gone through what twenty seven chapters of Genesis is what how much it is or is it yeah give or take 
So yeah, that we're we're done with Genesis and we move into Exodus, and it's not even until we get to Exodus twenty, when he hands down the Ten Commandments right. that we actually have right and wrong, some absolutes right. that come and give it to us. So as with eight kids, that is where it it comes down to, where it, did you hit your sister? Yes or no? Right. Is that is wrong? Don't do that. Right. Here's correction. You know, did you take that toy from that person? That is wrong. Don't take from them. Mm-hmm. And it, it it really does flow well into um, the Ten Commandments. Right. Right. It's, it's a very basic uh, law for humanity. Right. So a big part of our conversation last time around had to do with um, what happens when someone doesn't necessarily believe in an absolute truth. And something you stated that was really interesting was um, – in order to state that there is no absolute truth, that's an absolute in itself. Because what you're saying effectively is that absolutes don't exist for anything. Right. But that in itself is an, absolute. an absolute. Correct. Right. So it's it's um, an illogical statement right. to say that there is no absolute truth. Right. Um, that everyone has their own truth inside of them. That is then your truth. Then your right. absolute truth is everyone has truth truth inside of them. Right. Um, a very Buddhist mindset how do we how do we reconcile that there be, so here's the situation uh we'll go back to genesis one the you know adam and eve are in the garden of eden um and could god have created a tree that only had good and not evil right uh he could he could have created that but he didn't he created a tree that had knowledge and the fruit that it bears um yielded what would define truth for uh, or excuse me, good and evil for those who consumed of that tree. Something interesting happens there, right? Because God's, God denies them that access. He says, do not eat from that. Right. And when I, when I encounter that in Scripture, what it, what it brings me to it is to this understanding. God wanted to be God for them, didn't want them to go out and, and have to search out what was right and what was wrong for themselves. Uh, and what, what makes that point quite a bit salient is when we understand that once they knew what was right and what was wrong, they would have to be held accountable. Mm. They would have to be held mm. accountable to what, to like, Hey, that was wrong. And so as you were talking about your kids is you can't really hold them accountable until they know. Right. Uh, up, up until that point, they're, they're your baby. They're innocent. They, they could do no wrong. And even if it is wrong in the sight of someone, so something that babies tend to do, uh, especially in their toddler ages, is they love to just take off their clothes. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who's watching. They don't, they have, to them, it doesn't matter. It's not usually about until about the age of five or six years old where they start getting that, like, oh, I probably shouldn't be naked in front of everybody. Um, but prior to that, they don't know, right? And so... You know, would it be wrong for a parent to to walk up to a child who's just stripped off their diaper for the fifth time to grab them and spank them because they've ta- they've gotten naked in front of everybody? Um, it's funny you say that because I was just having this conversation with some of my coworkers, and it, something had come up about parenting because um, my well the, the what it was is that my kindergartner had graduated kindergarten uh, today, and so they were asking me about it and. One of the things that, I, that came around in the conversation was some advice that was given to me, some really good friends of ours. Uh, they live out in Tennessee now. Um, what, what they told me was you have to, as a parent, discern what is foolishness mm. and what is rebelliousness. Right. Because foolishness, that requires a loving hand. Right. That's, that, that is... Uh, not knowing that's an innocent mm. error that occurs but rebelliousness is an, a, a strict like i am going against the rules against the right. grain and so a child and and having eight kids i've walked through a lot of young children they have no idea right and you can tell them for the umpteenth time right. the billionth time it's still foolishness to them right because they don't grasp the concept that right. this is wrong now all they've grasped right if you pick up a child and spank them all they've grasped is they can't push boundaries and explore without receiving pain. Right. Which, in some instances, that is a fact. But as the parent, are you the one that needs to inflict the pain right. and create that division between you and your child? Right. And, I, th- and I mean, it really boils down to um, how the Lord deals with us, too. Yeah. So, and, and as you're saying that, well, so let's 
coming back to Genesis, let's see what actually happens there in Genesis uh, during the fall in Genesis 3. Uh, Satan goes to the woman and says, did God really say? Right. right? And, and then he, he fills in the blanks. You know, if you eat from this, you're going to die. If I could, too, uh, it's nearly uh, parallel to what Satan does to Jesus. Right, right. right. So. Uh, and, and I would argue that it's what he does to all of us. Right. Did God really say? Right. And, and crazy that that we would even have this part of the conversation. But when you speak about the movement of the Holy Spirit, when you're talking about how the Holy Spirit moves in and through us, uh, something really interesting happens. There's a lot of people today that say God doesn't speak that way anymore. Uh, right. he, he, w- he won't speak to you directly anymore. Uh, if you want to know what he has to say, go find it in Scripture. And I would agree with that. However... Uh, I only agree with the part that go find it in Scripture, right? So if someone comes to me and says, hey, the Lord has said this, uh, I'm going to take what they said the Lord said. One is I'm going to hold them accountable to what they just said because that's what Scripture teaches us to do. Uh, And two, I'm going to go root it out with Scripture. If it's not in Scripture, I unfortunately cannot accept the word. Right. Uh, However, um, to combat some of the the extremes, I think a lot of people have gone to that space of saying, well, God doesn't speak to us that way anymore. And and so when you say, well, the Lord said to me, you know, the Lord uh, has called me to, to, to serve him. The Lord has promised me um, whatever he has promised me. So for like Remnant Church, uh, there's a big call on Remnant Church. And a lot of times when you look at Remnant Church, you're like, well, is it going to happen? But I think that's where the enemy is. That's that's enemy territory right there. Did God really say? Right. Right. And so he goes to this woman. And he says, did God really say that if you eat from here, you're going to die? Uh, so he challenges what she the, the, the truth that has been instilled in her. He challenges that and and deceives her into into eating from this tree. She's eaten from this tree and now she's a, she's culpable. Now she can be held accountable for the things that are right and what are wrong. What we see is this pattern uh, throughout Scripture where the Lord says, you know, I don't want you to have judges. I will be your judge. Right. A, a, a human judge is going to deal harshly with you. A human judge is going to be very, very, uh, you know, incredibly harsh with you. He's going to judge according to what he believes. And that goes back to what you were saying. This, I believe X. Uh, and whatever that is, that's my set of beliefs. That's my set of values. And, I, and I'll move from there. And every decision that I make is premised on that set of beliefs. Uh, the unfortunate part is, and as God is telling Eve, is, look, this is what's going to happen, and you're going to die. Um, it's an it's, it's a incredibly um, strong point that the Lord makes them. Satan challenges it, and then now they've eaten. Now they're held accountable, both her and her husband, who have eaten from, the, from this fruit. Um, what that goes to, to, to show us, though, is that uh, at some point, there has to be a way to measure truth. There has to be. Uh, and for Adam and Eve, it was go seek the Lord. Right. Go find it with the Lord. Right. Um, there is a there is a an old philosopher, and I'm drawing a blank with with what his name is. Um, but he presents this argument: is does God love good people or are people good because God loved them mm. right it's it's a it's a flawed argument um, because it's not it, it's not seeing the the whole picture of truth so what set of rules does, does God live by what tells God what is right what tells God what is good what are your thoughts on that well I I mean you touched on so many things that I could go off on tangents about but one of the things that really strikes a chord with me is um, truth is a person we have facts that happen to us but the truth of the matter is Mm -hmm. is one person right and and we as followers of Christ as people who love Christ right And, and I say that specifically because he gives us what we should be doing and these are essentially the laws right that sums up all the laws that are put out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy right and even in Exodus to some is to love the Lord your God Deuteronomy uh, 6 4 right mm-hmm. love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength mm. and then love your neighbor as yourself yeah 
And in these two thing, two th- statements, right, the whole law is fulfilled. Um, and that comes from Christ. So Christ has now dictated to us what it is we are supposed to do. But I had this thought the other day, mm-hmm. right, um, that there are a lot of different um, sects and even uh, religions that have spun off from those two statements right that say this is how <coughs> excuse me this is how god loves you and this is how you earn his favor mm. but it, it, if that was the case then hebrews 11 never occurred right um and what i mean by hebrews 11 is by faith these people were accounted for as righteous right right Sarah laughed in the face of God. Yeah. And she's yeah. called righteous. Right. Right. That that is huge because it's by their faith. And so as as you draw as you were drawing this picture, where does truth end? Truth ends on one person and what he did for us. Right. And then it it starts with us committing to that. And the way we commit to that is that we say we're all in. Mm. We can't go halvesies, right? Uh, you, you just you you can't because it's been I I have been told and I've followed the logic that a half truth is a whole lie, mm-hmm. and so if you're gonna go halfway in on loving Jesus, if you're gonna say, well, you know, I'm gonna try it out for a bit, right? You know, you you don't understand what he did. You don't understand the truth of who he is. Right. Right. Uh, and that's the absolute about that. Right. And I and I know that there's probably going to be rebuttals and arguments to that. You know, well, everyone has their own God or there's only Allah or, uh, you know, Jesus and Satan are brothers or right. you know, these are these are truths that are spun from a lie. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I believe and that's only because it doesn't spin from the the key facet of Christianity, right? When you go through Islam, you mm. go through uh, Judaism, right? The two major monotheistic religions in the world, aside right. from Christianity, right? Yeah. And you go through um, Hinduism, you go through Buddhism, you go through Confucianism, right? These are all... All those religions talk about how you can do good to earn favor. Right. But here's the opposite of what Christianity says. And true Christianity says you do nothing to earn favor. Yeah. You didn't earn it at all. Right. In fact, in fact, the truth of the matter is you can't right. earn it. Right. There's no way. Period. There's right. no way you can be as holy and righteous as God to right. be enter into heaven. There's no way you can do it. Yeah. That, that uh, goes back to the whole purpose of the law, right? Um, it's if we move into this uh, perspective of like antinomialists where the law is already perfected and, you know, we can do no wrong. We can do um, n- like nothing. It doesn't matter how wrong we do. I we mean, it's you know, contrary to what Jesus said, though. Right. But it is. It is. But um in the, I mean, this is this is uh, something that's plagued the church for as long as the church has been around. Ever since uh, John died, yep. Right. Uh, we're, we're looking at um, uh, the Nicolaitans who profess that very thing. We have truth. We have truth. They were broken. They were broken from a Gnostic se- uh, sect. Uh, the Gnostics believed that Jesus was a man. Believed that he died and that he was raised, possibly. Um, but he, w- what brings him power is the amount of knowledge that he had, uh, because he does call himself the way. He does call himself the truth, and so these Gnostics are, are professing some of the same stuff that Jesus was saying, but it was only partial. Uh, along come the Nicolaitans, and they are professing a very similar thing. What they're saying is, well, th- there is no law, but there is um, in our belief in Jesus Christ. And our belief in Scripture as the absolute truth, um, what we're going to c- encounter, regardless which way we turn, left, right, up, or down, it doesn't matter which way we turn, is that the law um, 
God's law, God's moral law, has, has withstood um, the test of time. Uh, when people say, well, Jesus fulfilled the law, they're absolutely right. He, di- he did. He fulfilled the ceremonial law. Uh, and in many ways, the civil law that, that existed during his walk on the earth, he complied to. Uh, what he doesn't say is done away with is the moral law. That moral law remains intact today. So we can't go around and just say, well, my God doesn't do, my Jesus doesn't do. Um, it's some, so something that you had said that just kind of it surfaced that was um, how many of us in Christianity say, well, my Jesus wouldn't do that. He would love people differently. Uh, if someone, let's say, let's talk about a hot topic. Let's talk about something that is um, contra scripture. Uh, and is being accepted or tolerated very much within the church, with the, within the church body. Um, this gender dysphoria, uh, something has happened where now the Christian body is beginning to accept, hey, this is okay, this is tolerable. Um, we run into a, a, a big, giant problem. Because uh, I'm not saying don't love the one who's having the issue. Uh, what I'm saying is that we have to engage them. We have to be able to walk with them in what they're doing, in what they're suffering with, uh, and and being the light that they can walk out, right? So we have to shine that light. But we can't even begin to do that until we accept who Jesus actually is. Does Jesus speak against something like this? And I would argue that he does. Um, he's presented this way. Uh, what are What is the greatest law? And he he says, well, the first is this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Okay. And what's, and he says, but it doesn't end there. It goes on, right? He says, and the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. An incredibly deep statement by Jesus Christ. Obviously, he's, I mean, just about everything he says, right? Um, I think that's recorded, yeah. (laughs) That is recorded, correct. Um, So what does that mean? Well, if I take the first fragment of that statement and I say well love the Lord your God with all your souls with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength um, those are the first five commandments the second of which is you will not have any idols carved out of images or made up of really anything anything that isn't the Lord your God right and that means that I can't go around and say my Jesus wouldn't do and fill in the blank Right. Because I'm no longer worshiping Jesus. What I'm doing is I've made up an image of the Jesus I would like to see, the Jesus that I would like to, to have uh, as, as my friend. Um, and, and we reach a really dangerous position. The Nicolaitans were great at doing it because they wanted to dismiss um, what they were doing and not be held accountable for it. But this goes back to that standard. The Lord has a standard. He sets it before us. Um, the Lord doesn't go to a standard. He doesn't have to go look up in a book and define these 10 rules are the things that tell me what good is. I don't love people because they're good. I don't love people and then they're good. Uh, I loved before they even were. Nothing tells the Lord what is good. He defines what is good. And in that, um, that means that I can't make up for myself, well, this is good or that's good, or that's bad, right? Um, And that can take us just about anywhere. Um, Having been in the the military, uh, I'm sure you've seen your share of really awesome stuff, right? The best. Yeah. Um, And I'm sure there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff out there that that, um, people have tried to justify as good. And it doesn't matter if they try to justify it as good. If it doesn't align with what the Lord has called good, we can't even begin to call it good, right? I, I, um, I mean, it's funny you say that because it's not just in the military that you would see it. You see it within yourself. Yeah. Um, I find it when I am in discussions with uh, my wonderful spouse. I find that um, I try to justify some of the actions that I may take. Mm-hmm. And it's really just to make sure that I'm covered. That right. No, 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 it's okay that I did this. Right. It's okay that I, uh, you know, didn't do the dishes. That's okay. Right. And I work hard, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that I said I was going to, and I didn't do it, and it hurt her feelings. Right. 
So uh, to go back to, I mean, you, you touched on so many things, and I, <coughs> it's hard not to interrupt you when I'm when Oh, feel when free you're to talking. interrupt. You're, um, you're good. I, uh, I think it, it boils down to knowing that he loved you first. There's yeah. nothing you, like I said, there's nothing you can do that earns his love. Uh, right. And, and even when you go back and you say, well, James says uh, you have to you have to work in order yeah. to show yourself, you know, approved and loved. I mean, if you if you look, if you really want to boil down to it. Right. Paul and James probably were saying the exact same thing, because mm -hmm. even Paul goes down and he says, uh, you know, don't just believe someone that they believe Jesus. Wait till they show it. Right. Right. And James says that he says, you know, you can't just say, I believe in Jesus and not have fruit. So uh, besides the point that that is. We believe in Christ mm. because he loved us first. Yeah. And that's what that's just hands down how that works. And then once you accept that, there's nothing you can do other than love him back right. or rebel against him. Right. So you have, you have two of those those two options. Um, I know I'm trying to I'm trying to get my thought back. The absolute, the absolute part of Christ is that He is God. Mm -hmm. And then there's no way around that. So as you had said, we have the law, and it went before us. It was so bad, humanity couldn't do it for, mm -hmm. we'll say, four thousand years for you young Earthers out there. For 4,000 years, humanity couldn't do it. Yeah. So he had to show up and do it. Right. He did it. God came down and he proved to everyone that he is the only one that can fulfill the law. Right. And right. so you talk about bouncing things off scripture. That's the other thing I wanted to, to say. I, there is, if you can't find it in scripture and you feel the Lord telling you, this is where you have your brother and right. your sister, and you say, man, I am hearing this. Right. You know, we're, we're two or more gathered, right? And you sit there and you pray mm. together and say, wow, we're, we're combating this. I mean, if you're out there and you're struggling with gender dysphoria, dysphoria and you believe in Christ and you're like, I really feel like the Lord's calling me to be the opposite gender. Well, hold on. You know, do bounce it off scripture. Right. And then bounce it off someone you trust. Right. You, know, you don't just walk into a church and be like, hey, I think I might be a a boy and I'm a girl, or I think I right. might be a girl and I'm a boy, um, you're just going to get lambasted because those people don't know you. Right. They don't know you from Adam. Literally, they don't they have no idea who you are. So right. you got to, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but bounce it off scripture. But at the same time, there are so many cultural references within scripture that don't apply today right. that you can't always take scripture and say it's not in scripture, so I'm not going to believe it. Right. Right. The whole reason the Lord gave us the word is to show his character to us. That's right. So we watch, we read through Genesis, and we see God's mercy in Genesis. And yeah. you're like, oh, wait a minute, they got cursed. They got kicked out of the garden. Whoa, 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 time out. First off, I wouldn't call that a curse. I think it's a curse to be living in paradise with disobedience and no uh, no ability to get rid of it. Right. So you're living with constant rebellion in your heart and you can't get rid of it. Right. So the Lord says, I have to cast you out. And then he, he even goes further and he goes, Adam, I'm going to put weeds in the ground. I'm going to make this hard for your sake. There's, this doesn't sound like a curse at all. To the woman, he goes, I'm going to make childbirth more painful. Right. Right. I, I'm, I'm not going to try and say and justify that. That might be a curse. That one might be. But <laughs> well, having I'm seeing seven births because I missed yeah. one for the deployment. That's not. My wife is the strongest woman I know. So, yeah. Um, so you walk through Genesis and you get to Exodus. And you still see his mercy right. when he f hands out the law. And right. Paul says in Romans, I believe it's Romans, he goes, the law had to come so we knew we sinned. That's right. You yeah. can't sit there and say, I have the truth. I have the absolute truth, and I'm okay with this. Right. Without knowing that the person who created you, the God of the universe who created everything and created you, 
Mm -hmm. knit you together in your mother's womb, has an absolute righteous standard that you will never live to if he never speaks the boundary. I'm not walking right. through right. boundaries right now. If I don't speak a boundary and someone breaks my boundary, right. whose fault is that? Yeah, yeah. And that, so that actually goes right to and just how we started this conversation, which, which is having eight, eight different children. First of all, they're all different. Very much from so. the youngest to the oldest, right? They're they're all different. Their, their character is different. Their personality is different. Um, but you're right. Establishing the boundary from the beginning. Here's the boundary. This is how I want you to to form, right? So you begin to form that child in a certain way. You you're not going to change that that kid's personality or that kid's characteristics unless you start becoming very abusive or very just very hands off, right? Because now it grows up wild. Um, it, the child grows up <laughs> wild. <laughs> we are talking about gender dysphoria. No, so. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but establishing those boundaries, uh, and that's what, uh, as you bring up Romans, right? So Romans one eighteen to thirty two. It seems like um, this just blast against humanity. Like, hey, you guys chose to not honor me. You guys chose to not believe in me. It was obvious that I, it's obvious that I exist. Uh, you can see that in all of nature. Nature reveals that I exist, this being God. Uh, and you guys chose to do whatever you guys wanted to do. And for that reason, I'm going to turn you over to your own devices. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Sounds like the state of our country right now. Right. Right. And in that, um, it's, it's like the Lord was just really frustrated with humanity because they wanted to do whatever. They didn't want to listen to God anymore. We see it evolve later on when we look at how philosophy develops, and philosophy is an attempt to resolve what theology couldn't resolve, and so... Well, that's ridiculous, because philosophy came first, but... Well, I guess it depends who, who you're talking to, If right? you're talking... Well, strictly speaking of the word theology, right? right philosophy came from the Greek philosophers, right? right? So right. And then theology came from Christian theologians, right? right. So... Well, no, because theology came from the study of God. So as far back as Moses, we can call him. Right, but I mean the, the origins of the word. The word itself. Yep. Right, right. Boom. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. stuff. Good stuff. stuff. <laughs> but so here's the situation. You know, so, so when, we look at, when we look at Romans and we see these are all the things you're doing wrong. And so I'm going to turn you over to your own devices. By the way, Romans 1 we come across an, another section of scripture that speaks against um, a gender dysphoria or uh, homosexuality, and period. Now, notice the way that Paul does it. He presents truth. This is what God desires. Right. This is how we failed. And this is the way back. Right. So the law came and it, and it shows what you're not supposed to be doing. Then grace comes, and grace, it, it, it covers a multitude, a multitude of sins. Uh, but he challenges the, the, the reader. He challenges the listener and says, should we go on sinning? Because one of the, sec uh, one of the parts in, in Romans says, uh, where sin was greater, where sin was great, his grace was greater. So should we go on sinning? And then he says, absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. Right. So all of this. So we can we can pull out homosexuality or gender dysphoria and say, well, these two sins, we can pick on those, but it would be the same for the adulterer. It'd be a, the same for the thief. It'd be the same for the liar, for the one who says, well, I'm only telling half-truths, right? So, uh, and the reality is uh, that a half-truth is a full lie. Absolutely. It, there's only bits and parts of truth in it, right? Right. So, I mean, this, uh, Satan gives you half-truths all the time. Right, and right. And he's considered a liar. So, I mean, you talk right. about your absolute truth in Christ, who calls Satan a liar, and Satan only gives you half-truths. Right, so. right. Again, it goes back to, did God really say? Right? Did God say that you, you won't die? You won't die. Look, eat from it. Eat from this, right? And it's, it's the same thing that he tells us when we're messing with our sin. You won't really die. Nothing will really happen to you. Right. Uh, for the person who's struggling with the with the gender dysphoria, hey, you were you weren't born uh, to be a man. You were born to be a woman, but you're trapped in a in a man's body. I, I can't get over how we celebrate um, someone like uh, Bruce Jenner, right? And I think his name came up last last time we were talking about this. But uh, I 
This is a man who is a full-blown man who lived his entire life as a man and then decides he's going to be a woman. So then he begins to transition. He begins to do stuff to his body to make himself look like a woman. Uh, and he, he wins Woman of the Year. I mean, in a, in, a, in a time period, an age where we celebrate women's rights, how could we say a man now is going to be the best woman out there? Do we hear what we're saying to each other? Well, I think, I mean, I can go off on tangents, but that is seems to be the narrative from a certain political spectrum. Sure. The uh, neo-Jacobins, as I like to call them. Right. Um, they are not the JFK Democrats anymore. Right. Um, they, but that is what culture is trying to dictate. And it, it's interesting that you, you know, you bring this, you bring that up, and a lot of my thoughts go to uh, our pride as a country. And if I just could take a, a step back, um, we won. We won in 45. We won in 91. We won. Mm -hmm. And where did we sit? What happened during the 90s? I think we all fell asleep Yeah. as a country. We weren't yeah. scared to death every night that a nuclear weapon would fall on our head. Right. And so we fell asleep culturally. You know, at morally, we fell asleep. You know, we celebrate the president who committed perjury and then on national te television, mm -hmm. you know, apologizes for it. And we say, oh, he was the best president ever. Better than Lincoln? Better than Washington? Or Washington had slaves. Are you out of your mind? So you're just going to tell someone because of their culture, how their culture says it's okay. I mean, that again is... That in itself is illogical. Right. You're going to sit there and say it's not right to have slaves when you're in the 1700s. That's not. You, I agree with you. That's still not right. right. But the cultural aspect of that was, hey, this is what we're doing, and so, okay, right. it's it's not frowned upon. You fast forward to today, and you have nearly the exact opposite mindset. Which, by the way, I think the neo Jacobin Party is still racist and still suppresses the black people oh, yeah. by right. making them into right. children. Right. I don't know if they realize that. They sit there and go, oh, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. Yeah, welcome to stepdad's house where there are no rules right. Right. as long as you show up to the house. Right. right. I, I mean, it's a very impassioned subject inside of me because it, it's lunacy. Right absolute lunacy to be able to have these beliefs like this and then point a finger. I mean, someone's going to point a finger at this if they listen to it and call you intolerant. Sure. How dare you call sure. Caitlyn Jenner a man? He became a woman, and now he's a woman. You're intolerant. Right. But that in, that statement in itself is intolerant. Right. Right, absolutely. Because it, what it takes is it takes what – so I have to ascribe to their belief, but I can't have a belief. So this is this comes back to that that point of well, absolute you can't truth. have a belief that opposes theirs, right. right? Right. So it does come back to the absolute truth because they hold a truth, right. a standard, that is different than ours. Sure. And so long within the church community, I would say even growing up through the '90s, I don't know how late this goes, how far this goes back, but going up through the '90s and the early thousands, we fell asleep. Yeah. We morally fell asleep. Right. Right. And, and the church, I don't know if the church is ever going to wake up because right. the bottom's about to come out. The bottom's about to fall out of this house. So the, the church doesn't have a choice. That's like bottom line. The church doesn't have a choice. It needs to wake up. The Lord is rattling cages right now. Right. And, right. And, and right. Um, there are those who will remain in their slumber. Right. Uh, Revelation 1 through 11, I believe it is, it talks about Ephesus. Ephesus, you you have fallen away from your first love, right? More than just you stopped loving, you have fallen away from your first love. And the admonishment there is be quick to repent, wake up, because if you don't, I'm going to remove your lampstand, right? And the lampstand is the status of a church, right? A lot of churches base their status off of what the government says and says, well, the government says I'm a church, so now I'm a church. No, Probably wrong. Easy, yeah. Right, no, wrong. The end of story, wrong. Uh, what defines you as a church is the lampstand that the Lord places in you. The second part is that the, that scripture reminds us that Jesus is the one who is walking in the midst of the church. 
In other words, he's examining the hearts of the, of the body. But he continues to say, wake up, wake up, wake up, because you've fallen asleep and, and you have become a compromising body. Uh, and being this compromising body, you're look, you look more like the world than you look like my body. Uh, and that's not what I want. Uh, and he urges, uh, he urges Pergamum, hey, hold on, hold on to what you have, right? You know, you, you've got to fight this out. They, he says that they're living in the in the um, the throne of Satan, right? And when we look at what's happening in our country right now, our country, um, we have we are in an uproar over the murder of unborn children. Well, we s- we've seen that in scripture. We f- we see that in scripture that they offer up these um, these infants to a different God. They, they, they're burning them alive. The answer is prayer, yeah. They are burning these babies alive, and, and, and God finds it detestable. detestable. Yes, that's right. So contrary to uh, my body, my choice, I agree that the woman, woman has the, the rights over her own body. Absolutely. What you don't have the rights over is another person's life. Because that becomes an illogical statement. So, so you're a person. You deserve rights. That's right. You do. But that baby, that baby also has rights. It was, and it just came up in the Senate hearing about abortion and trying to um, solidify Roe Ro v. Wade. Uh, Senator Johnson from uh, Louisiana did a great job. And he pointed out to the abortion advocate he goes, when does life start? Right. When does life start? Because it's not okay to kill kill a 10-year-old. We know that. Right. There's court cases against that. It's not okay to kill a 2-year-old. We know that. Right. There's court cases. It's not okay to kill a 1-week-year-old. There's court cases against that. Right. There, there are court cases against, so if you were to kill a, a the, pregnant woman, a pregnant woman, you get double homicide. That's right. Right. So, so, so there are court cases that, that give us, right, Every in law, every case has to stand on its own merit, but there is case law that we study from. Right, case law shows us that at some point as a country, we acknowledged that that baby that was developing inside that woman's body becomes is a, a life. person. It is a life. Yeah. Right. So, so what are we what are we arguing for? So let's go back to scripture. Well, what is the absolute truth? When does life begin? Well, it's there in Leviticus. Life is in the blood. The moment that that cluster of cells that people want to say a human right zygote, yeah. the, the moment that that blood begins to course through its veins, that's a human life. That is a human life. You cannot, you cannot terminate that life, and not call yourself a murderer. End of story. Right, and and this goes back to um, having your kids. Right, I have ran into a couple of different couples. Who I mean, some one couple has a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. Um, another couple just never used protection because they firmly believed that. Uh, I mean, both couples. Excuse me. Both couples don't use protection. They firmly believe that God is the author of life. Mm. And you have one couple that has uh, six kids, um, but they had a hard time getting pregnant. And the other couple we know uh, only had three kids. Now it, I don't know what their intimacy was their intimate life was how often they physically connected right um but that the fact that they wouldn't use any type of protection no pill no condom nothing and yet they only came out with three kids it it, i mean and you have uh the drug addict who's on methamphetamine has sex once with some other drug addict for a whole 10 seconds right right and all of a sudden there's a baby right so who who put that baby there? Right. Was it just that good of a shot? Right. It, it, str- I've struggled with this, right? right. The l- I know the Lord had called me into a world where abortion is so prevalent that I need to have all the babies. And it, it's been hard because I've even had church members look at me and say, you're crazy. What right. are you doing? You're right. doing too much. Right. This is not God. It's just, I'm like. But yet it is because he's right. the one that makes life. M- my mother-in-law <coughs> um, is a is actually a um, a kind of a 
Um, I'll use her story as, as an example, though, because you talk about at what point uh, is it you, at what point is it the Lord, right? So my wife is the oldest of five five kids. Right? You were married how long and you don't know that? Long. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> I think she's watching, too, so thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> I help. But the, uh, the, the youngest um, was born after her... Um, her mother's tu- tubes were tied, so how did that how did that egg get down there? Right, right. And, and were both tubes tied? Yes. So yeah. how did that egg get through that fallopian right. tube? Right. So it, and and that tells you at some point whether it's because of contraceptives or not contraceptives. Look where where the Lord is calling life. There's going to be life. Uh, we do have to consider what we're doing, right? So if we're out there and we're being promiscuous. Uh, we can't say, well, I didn't know what the consequences were going to be, right? So if you have a credit card that's, that's $10,000 and you go and you max it out, right, can you tell the the credit card company, oops, uh, I didn't mean to spend that. Uh, don't punish me for having spent the money. Don't, like, how, how are they not going to come and, and say, hey, it's time to pay up? Right. Right, so um, it's... It's an illogical belief that we can go and be promiscuous and do whatever we want, uh, and not have any sort of any sort of consequences. Uh, and not to say that children are consequences. I believe that they're a blessing from the Lord. I understand there are situations out there that uh, people would say, "Well, what if the woman was raped?" Uh, looking at abortion studies, it's like minus. It's like a. It's like 0.003% of women who have abortion would say it's because of incest or because of rape. The majority of them, in large part, are saying it's an impingement or an infringement on their lifestyle. That, to me, doesn't satisfy. That sounds like birth control. Right. That doesn't sound like uh, a medical reasoning, a true medical reason. But, again, where's my truth? Right. If we don't start with the truth, and the truth is that that baby is a life, right? So in the case of abortion, the baby is a life. Uh, even if it hasn't taken its first breath, it's still a life. If we go to the gender dysphoria and we say, well, we don't know what we are, the truth is that there's only two genders. And it's interesting that those who are having a gender transition, there's only one other option for them. So check this out. If you're a female and you now want to be a male, there's only one other choice, right? So female to male or male right. to female. Yeah. So so we can I mean you can't <laughs> you can't transition into pony or acorn or tree or stand by. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> oh I know it. Stand I know by. It. <laughs> I know it. But the thing is that we are gonna acknowledge and we'll we'll pick on uh Mr. Uh, Jenner, once more, um, he didn't transition to something else. He wanted to be a woman. Well, if I'm a feminist, I'd be up in arms, right? Because you mean to tell me that a man can be better than any other woman? I don't think a man can, like, reach uh, There's no the scope. I, I'm going to be honest. Is. There's no way I can be a woman. Right. And, and I'm not saying that, like, as a, a negativity, I'm saying women are so powerful in themselves right. that, I mean, for, for crying out loud, the the Mayans worshipped a woman. They worshipped how a woman gave birth. Right, right. Because there's something different <laughs> about a woman than there is from a man. The, f- the first time God said something wasn't good was when man was alone. Right, so he had to make the best thing of man. Right. He takes something from that man. And he makes something perfect for him. Which, side note, I think that's why men are so crazy, because women stole all the emotions. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> so, but when, you, when, you, when we look at how does that relate to Scripture, and how do we engage with those people, with that community of people, w- for a long time, the church was not the place to go. Let's make it very clear. The church was never meant to be inclusive. It is what I like to call exclusively inclusive. That means that until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the church really 
if you don't want to surrender, I should say it this way. If you don't want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the church isn't for you. Well, and I'll, and I'll try to elaborate more on that because I think everyone's welcome. Absolutely. Everyone is welcome. That's right. why I, I understand the whole it's exclusive but inclusive also. Right. Um, so everyone is welcome to right. come. But if you want to be a part of this community, you need to surrender. Right. And that's when we see that in Acts right. when uh, what's their names died from the Holy Spirit. Peter, uh, Peter, you know, spits lightning. Ananias out. and Sapphira. Yeah, lightning comes from Peter's mouth, strikes them both dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, that's how it works. I'm pretty it was open sure. It was. Yeah. <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, but you see, the Holy Spirit. It was. It was the Holy Spirit gave the elders, sp- specifically Peter in this right. instant, um, the the vision or the knowledge of what they did. Right. And said, hey. And gave them a chance to repent. Yes. Did you take too much money? And, you know, did you take a little off the top? Right. And what happens? He dies. Right. So they take his body off. Yeah. Then she walks in, gives her a chance. Did you take a little off the top? Not knowing what happened to her husband. And then she dies. Right. She said, no, I didn't. And she did. Right. And so it's it's about the community. I mean, this is where a lot of Christian communists come in and said, look, it's a commune. They sold everything and put it together. It's wacky. Mm-hmm. It's not. That's not how that worked at all, because right. Paul went out and uh, made money on mission well, trips. And, but and Peter said, Peter says something to Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, he says, um, before you, because they, what they were telling the congregation was, look, we sold everything and we've given it to the church. Right. Um, and, and so it wasn't for withholding some of it. Because Peter says, look, while it was yours, it remained yours. Before you sold it, it was yours. And after you sold it, the money was yours. You didn't have to lie. And you could have just said, hey, here's what, I, what I'm bringing. You didn't have to lie. And that's what, that's what the, 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 the big uproar was over is the lie. It, again, I mean, it's not really a big uproar, the Holy Spirit killing people. Uh, I consider that a fairly big uproar. I'm, if you I upset don't. I the don't Holy know Spirit. if there was a uproar physically happening. I th- yeah. You know, I think people are like, oh, wow, they lied. Oh, now they're dead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we are now. All right. And that's why we don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Mm, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, th- and, and again, they could have remained. They would have stayed a part of the congregation if they had decided, well, we're only going to give half. Or we're not going to give anything. In fact, we're not going to sell anything. Uh, it's ours. And they would have still been welcome. And this goes back to the, the, you know, when you come to church, you're welcome. You can come and stay. Uh, David Wilkerson, I, I like when he, well, when he would tell the story, um, had at one point, I think it was, he, I think he mentioned seven transvestites who came to initially to, to kind of. Um, Confront him? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they showed up to, they show up to his congregation um, and they stayed. Oh, wow. And, and over the years, as they gave their life to Christ, they uh, repented? They repen- well, several of them repented. He's, yeah. He notes a handful that, that remained, a few of them that had left. But they repented. And that's the work of the church, right, is that we're calling, we're, we're call, we're calling people out of the sin. So it doesn't matter whether it's homosexuality or, or again, a, adult, an adulterer. Hey, you, if you are actively... Uh, having an affair, the church doesn't say, go away. The church says, are you willing to surrender? Hey, this is what truth is. So now I've got to present truth to you. The people who don't want to hear the truth, um, that's, it's, where, that's where Paul says, get, kick them out. Right, right. And and you know what? It's, it's, it's crazy because today, if you tell anybody, hey, we're going to kick someone out of the church. Right. It's like, no, not my Jesus. My Jesus would love them more. Right, right. And I think this goes in line with um, who you keep close to. Right. Right, because I, I would say David Wilkerson, Wilkerson had those transvestites show up on, you know, the, the Baptist Wednesday night where we just sit together and eat. Right. You know, but what you're not doing, and this is something that the church has lost too, is you're not sharing everything of your heart. Right. You're right. not being an open book for these right. people. Right. Right. You're sharing the gospel. You're sharing... Jesus, and then with your friend who you know loves Jesus, and you guys talk scripture, you're like, 
man, I am struggling with this. That's who you open up to. Right. That's the boundary that you need to have because that's the iron sharpening iron. Right. That right. sinner is going to tell you what, what's wrong with that. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and you're going to sit there and have to ask the same question. I was um, dealing I my mother had passed away and while I was in service and I went to some grief counseling. You know, the, the physical, the yearly physical, they say, are you feeling okay? I actually said, no, I actually don't feel okay. And they're like, How'd oh. that turn out for you? That was, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so they set me up with a counselor. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I was, I was walking through, um, I was walking through a pornography addi- addiction then. Um, and the counselor looked at me and said, well, what was wrong with that? Right. And it was a good question for me. Because it, ha- it made me rethink, what is my truth here? Hmm. What is it that I believe about this? Right. Um, and why is this wrong? Right. And so uh, g- going full circle back to, I-, I think it all boils down to the love that you need to have. And, it, and it, it's interesting. I, I do want to talk on this because I feel like I need to. But what's interesting is when we ate – and I say we because I'm a part of Adam, right? Mm-hmm. When we ate from the tree, we decided what was good and what was evil. Right. So then let's look at that and we go, Lord, you've called Abraham's seed. And you see it in Joseph. Yeah. And he is second to Pharaoh in Egypt. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, a, a Pharaoh rises up and doesn't remember Joseph. Um. And this goes, I know I've, I've talked to you a little about, but I think where slavery increased was because there was a huge economic collapse mm-hmm. and the labor got too expensive. So cheap labor is the best labor. Right. Um, it's which is where I think the fall of the Bronze Age occurred. Uh, that's just my, I mean, I have to do more research on that, so don't quote me on that, but uh, that's my thought. But, but it's prophesied about. Right. It was in uh, Genesis 17 or 16 where God God tells Abraham to look at the stars and say number them yeah. and then yeah. right afterwards says oh by the way I'm going to they're going to be in captivity for right. 400 years right. until the iniquity of the Amorite is complete right wait a minute so I know what's good and what's evil you're telling me that they're going to be enslaved for 400 years how is that good right you know what's what's interesting uh, if we touch on slavery and we'll touch on it briefly and we might have to rejoin again uh, but if we touch on slavery we also have to remember that for a long time especially in the Jewish culture being a slave a lot of times these slaves were treated a lot better than people who were destitute right so I'm not seeing the slaves in Egypt right so so initially they were welcomed into the land of Egypt. Yeah, they were. I think uh, they were a form of cheap labor until right. it became too expensive. And and then they became a nuisance because they were multiplying a lot faster than the Egyptians. They they were they were better uh, in many ways. Uh, they they just they exemplified the favor of the Lord that was on them. And when Pharaoh looks at them and says everything they touch is is good, like hey, we can use these people. Now we're going to expose them and exploit them. But that's what every government well, I, does. I think that's pride, too, because yeah. it was, I mean, he didn't know who Joseph was. He didn't right. realize the savior of Joseph. Right. And then sees that they touch everything and then also goes, wait a minute, I'm an Egyptian. Right. I'm better than you. That's right. Um, so, I mean, I see, I, and I only say that, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I only say that because of the things that they've made and the the artwork that comes out from Egypt. Right. There's this air about how they were vain. They were very vain right. people. Right. You can see it in the things that they made. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that's uh, the point I was, I'm trying to get back to is, is the 400 years. How is that good? Right. You know, if our absolute truth is that God is good, right? We come back to our absolutes. God's good. How is keeping someone enslaved for 400 years good? Right. And not even that, as we mentioned before, 440 years. Because the person that God chose wasn't ready. Right. He was just waiting. Just standing by. Right. Right. Which, which actually, I think, makes God a good God. Because can you imagine if he was like, well, you're not ready. Next. And he just throws you away. He doesn't throw you away. Right. Right. So it, and, it, and the crazy part is that, like, 
you think about what he has called us out of, I think about the stuff that he has called me out of and, right, and stuff right. that, that he has walked me through. I grew up in a Christian household. I, and he has yanked me out of stuff that I should never have been in. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, walking through some of the personal issues that I've walked through, I, um, lying on the floor screaming, mm -hmm. tears rolling down my eyes, and just realizing how good God is. Right. Because he waited 31, 32 years right. to tell me. Right. And, and, and it just it baffles me because logically that doesn't make sense. But yet somewhere in me, I go, I needed to wait. Right. I needed you to wait. Right. And, you know, it took 20 years for the Lord finally to tell me about my pornography addiction. It's like, right. I'm not going to be your sin for you. It took 20 years for him to say that to me. Right. Why? And that would have been nice to know, you know, step one. Hey, I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not going to be yeah. this for you. I and I've seen people. I've I've heard people in prayer, like ask to have an affair. Lord, just just one more time, just one more time. You sound like an addict, right? Just just this one, Lord. If I could just have this one, I will never do it again. And it's like, what are, what are you asking for, right? right? And the Lord's saying, No, I'm not going to do that for you. The thing is that when he finally comes to you and he shows up and he says, hey, let me present you with some truth. This is why I can't do what you're asking me. So topic for another day is, is does God answer prayer? I believe he does. But when we go to, um, and we kind of close up here, on absolute truth, there is one source, one, one source. And his name is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He declares himself to be truth. And the only way he can declare himself to be truth is if he is truth. Not I know the truth. The Angel of Days. Right. Not I have been with truth is I am truth. Um, just as he is the word and declares himself to be the word. Uh, this is where we go back and we say the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He has been, is, and always will be God. Right. That's where our truth lies. Anything that, that falls short of that, and I, and I understand people have different worldviews, but when you think about creator of heaven and earth, and something that you touched on, and I'm, I'm just kind of going to close up with this, and I'll get your thoughts, but uh, Hebrews 2 tells us that it was fitting for the creator of heaven and earth to then also become our savior, our salvation. In other words, not willing that any would be lost, right? Because every human being is important to the Lord. Every human being is precious to the Lord. I don't care where their lifestyle is or where it has led them. Every single human being is precious to the Lord. Amen. He decided, how precious are you to me? I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to take sin so that you can't be, so that, that this can't be held against you. And there's one thing <laughs> that, you, that you have to do is come to the cross. That's it. Um, the work of transformation happens by the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, so for David Wilkerson and the, the, his, the transvestites that were vis visiting him, however long they visited him for, him for before they gave their life to Christ, they were there. And he, from what uh, last time that I'd heard about it, and obviously before his death, um, was that they remained with the church. So um, there is transformation, but it comes back to how we present the word. It comes back to that space of saying, hey, church, wake up. Wake up. Quit. Quit giving soft garbage to people. Feed them the truth. Speak the truth. And at first, it's not nice. It's not easy. Um, and that we noticed here over the last, you know, few years ago um, when there was a lot of truth coming out and people didn't like it. Right. But it has to happen. In any case, I think uh, as it pertains to absolute truth, if we can start with that as a base, Scripture is going to define truth for us. There's a lot more that we can dig in and, and discover uh, if we choose to accept that there is only one source of truth. Right. Y your closing thoughts. Uh, 
I know one thing that I did want to touch on was why. Why do I need natural virtues? Why is this important? Why do I need to be good? Why do I have to be righteous? Um, and strictly from a uh, an anthropologist standpoint, if you look at the Code of Hammurabi, he gave law on everything. Mm. And I just read today, and I didn't realize this, Hammurabi's code has laws on marriage, who you can and cannot marry. And I haven't read them, so I don't know mm. the details of that. But that in itself right there should kind of ring some alarm bells for those who are questioning whether or not why we need to have an absolute moral truth. It's because society, in order to flourish, needs to rally around one truth. Hmm. If, if a civilization is going to thrive, there needs to be one truth that they stand behind. Right. And if they don't stand behind it, well, you might as well just call them two different civil civilizations. That's right. Um, and so you, in order to pursue a greater tomorrow, you need to have a rallying moral truth to hold to. And that just happens to be the righteousness of God. Right. And, and coming from the only religion that tells you you can't do it. Every other religion says you can try, maybe, yeah. possibly. Yeah. You, yeah. Christianity. If you do good enough. Right. If you do good enough. Christianity, right. true Christianity says, sorry, you can't. You just can't. You're not going right. to do it. Right. That's why I had to, as Jesus says, I had to do it for right. you. And, uh. And, and that was that was what I wanted to get across about why we need absolute truths. And the last bit, I will say, when I took a sociology class in 2013 from the University of Texas while on deployment, um, great professor, uh, definitely went, you could tell he did the hippie thing, right, and then came back to his Catholic roots. Uh, and as he taught, he didn't teach from a biblical standpoint, he taught from a textbook. One of the things that I found is that sociologists in the early 19th century developing what, how society is built, was already written down mm. in 500 B.C. as the latest date that we have of Exodus and De Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Right. Because the Lord already built society. Right. Everything that sociologists had come across, right, it said is new and found and this is, this is how society was built. Yeah. God already That's wrote right. it down. Yeah. It literally is almost word for word the exact same thing. Right. How you build a society. And so I think that also is a, a great uh place to sit and go, well, you know, if we're gonna be a great society, we need to have an absolute truth that we all sit behind. Right. And if this God, you know, already spoke science that was discovered thousands of years later. Maybe he's the true one. Maybe, yeah. maybe he is the real yeah. one. The one that remains, right? The grass wither, the flowers fade, but my word stays the same. Hasn't changed. That's right. It really hasn't. That's right. Well, with that, I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and sign off here. But I actually would love to continue engaging this this topic here with you, Tim. Um, I no, think I've got a lot to share. No, so absolutely, much. it's good. It's good um, because the big why behind the absolute truth. Oh, it's something that we can pry on quite a bit more. So. Uh, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook, thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you who will watch us at a later date on YouTube or check out our Spotify page uh, or Spotify, you'll, you'll hear the podcast there in audio form. Um, but in any case, uh, continue to, to tune in, and we'll have some more here for you at a later date. Uh, you guys have a blessed, have a blessed evening. Thank you.